Judging by the Snapchats and the social media that I woke up to this morning, there's a lot of people still never got home and still have no sleep. So um, I'm a wee bit hoarse here, but uh, I, I'm a wee bit better than most this morning. Well, look, it's brilliant that you joined us, Connell. We really, really appreciate it. Can you can you give us sort of, I suppose, the feeling at full time after extra time when Derry won 116 to 114 and it ends a 24-year famine run? Yeah, well, look, Derry have been in this position before and I've been in teams that have come down the stretch and, and have fallen short. And everybody went yesterday in the hope and expectation that this team was going to be good enough. But there were still question marks. What if they were behind? What if Donegal went after their kickouts? And... Both happened. Their kickouts malfunctioned a fair bit. Donegal went ahead by two points twice. They pushed on even an extra time. But this Derry team weren't to be denied with Brandon Rogers given a performance for the ages. You know, to score three points from full back, Mark and arguably the most influential player of a generation was just something that, that was so special. And at the final whistle, anybody that was there was just treated to something very special. If flood of red and white and and for, you know, and for anybody that, that wants rid of rin, provincial championships that it wanted to be in a clonus yesterday because it was good for the soul mm. it really is one of those fabulous um venues i have to say i was at an ulster final a few years ago and i just loved it because you're just in that natural bowl and it just feels like the whole world is almost falling in on top of you in there like can, what, how did you feel when that final whistle went whenever michael you know i had everything it went to extra time and then they got a free 13 metres out, which if it goes into the net, you lose the Ulster Championship. And it's happened before. And the fear of that was just incredible. Once the ball ricocheted out and, and Derry got it, you knew the final whistle was coming. And when it did come, it was just an incredible feeling. And you looked around and just to see the emotion in people's faces. And the majority of the crowd and the majority of kids that spilled into the ground weren't actually even born the last time Derry won an Ulster Championship. But the one thing that, you know, the likes of Conor Doherty and, and Podrick McGrogan they have been in Derry minor teams and Derry under-20 teams that have beaten Monaghan, Donegal, Tyrone. The inferiority complex of those younger players isn't there. They haven't suffered the, the bad defeats that, that some of us had. And, and, and probably at the finish-up, Donegal, the defeats of the last number of years, and it maybe stifled them because we're two up twice, and instead of pushing on, they set back as if afraid to actually go and win it. And, and that's the one thing where Declan Bonner will look at, and he'll be, he'll be very disappointed with it. Yeah, and the fact that you've beaten three Division One teams along the way, I mean, that shows nobody can question, you know, sometimes you hear that, that people question certain provincial titles because they've beaten Division Three teams and Division Four teams. Derry have done it the hard way. And I'm wondering, where does this put Derry in the overall pecking order heading into the rest of the season? Yeah, well, they've broken through the glass ceiling now. They've, they've, they've won a, a provincial title. It's something to hang their hat on. And where they go now, Dublin, Kerry are obviously ahead of the pack at this point, but Derry's very much tucked in there with the rest of the teams. And, and Dublin and Kerry won't particularly relish playing a Derry team who are defensively very, very compact. And while they still have a, a wee bit to show, the fact that they tried to kick ball yesterday, the wider spaces of the likes of Croke Park might actually suit them. And their heavy running game, especially in extra time, was the difference. And they're... they're they brought six players off the bench, which is very on Rory Gallagher like. He normally sticks with his start in 15. He brings on one, two subs, maybe. But they got a wee bit of depth into the bench and, and all the young lads that came in, you know, the Lachlan Murrays, um, you know, and then the bit of experience with the likes of uh, Paddy Cassidy, you know, made a huge difference and got them over the line because the longer that game was going on, Derry had the legs. They were going to win that game. Connor, mm -hmm. it prob probably wasn't for everybody, maybe the, the way the game was played out, but it is just a matter of time when you're you're 24 years waiting for an Ulster title. It's just a matter of getting over the line, isn't it? It's just it is literally just a matter of doing whatever you have to do, and that's that's what the what's what Derry did yesterday. They played better football to get to this point, but sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. Like I look at Kerry winning the All Ireland in 2014. Like that was uncharacteristic, maybe what they had to do. It goes against some Kerry principles or whatever, but they got over the line. And it was the same with Derry yesterday. You just do what you have to do on a given day. Yeah, and like if Derry had been playing Limerick yesterday, it could have been a very different game. But anybody that was going to an Ulster final in Clonus expecting a shootout was was deluding themselves. Um, when you have two Division I teams coming and it means so much to them, like they were going to be defensive. It was going to be a heavy possession-based game. And unfortunately... It doesn't add at times to the game, but it was thrilling in as far as, well, who's going to get the next score? Every point was so keenly fought that 
Um, it was just a war of attrition. It was always going to be that way, but for Derry, nobody cares. It was about getting over the line. You know, Derry have played in, in really good and exciting games before and came out second best, and, and that was never going to be good enough for anybody. You know, Rory Geller teams, they have an identity, and for a long time, maybe Derry didn't have an identity. Um, but if you look at Kerry and, and, and Dublin, whenever they lost the ball, they're flooding back in the defence, and possibly at the minute, because of the opposition they're playing, they don't have the resistance whenever they do turn the ball over and go forward. Um, I was in Croke Park for, for Dublin Kildare, and Kildare were brilliant for four or five minutes, and within 12 minutes the, the game was cooked. So, um, is that really what anybody wants? There was no benefit for Kildare, no benefit for Limerick, um, but the Ulster final won't be for everybody, but nobody in Ulster cares. It's, it's something we're so proud of, and um, for anybody that, that is dead against provincial championships, it did the soul good just to see the, the Derry support. And the fact that it was a new winner, it was 24 years, uh, just the spill of emotion. Um, if you win two or three, it doesn't happen. It's just that one day, and for everybody there, it was a, it was a real treat. Just after mm. Conlet, um, I believe it was open season, was it, to even to get into the Derry dressing room after? It was like it was like the old times, was it? Yeah, like it, it was incredible. Um, they just swung the doors open and, and, and the journalists came in because there was just pandemonium in the tunnel. The security couldn't keep supporters out of the tunnel. They couldn't keep supporters out of the changing rooms. Um, the players with children had them there. There were children, children were kicking football in the changing rooms. We were all in. It was just, it was something you would have seen 40 or 50 years ago. Um, the professionalism of modern teams and, and trying to keep people away. And you know what? It added to the occasion and everybody that was there just thought this was incredible. And the access to players after it um they didn't shy away they didn't get onto the bus the players were there for about two hours after the game and that left them come home very late to mahara last night and uh, i would imagine there's very little sleep to be had and possibly by wednesday somebody will, some one or two of them will go to bed <laughs> do, do you think conlon that Derry can kick on from here because all are in quarter final you don't know who you're going to face in that you're on the same side of the draw as galway and i know we're kind of imagining a couple of steps ahead but do you look at this now and think this season is open and out for Derry because Galway or because Kerry and Dublin are on the other side? I don't know. I think it depends who comes through the qualifiers and how they come through and, and whether they sustain injuries, whether it's just suspensions. You know, any team that comes through to meet Derry now is coming off the back of two victories against top end opposition. Um, so it is going to be very difficult. You know, Derry's goal at the start of the year, Rory Geller said it before the championship draw was even made that winning in Ulster is what they're really about. And they've done that now, and then it'll be reassessing that. Um, no matter how it goes now, Derry have had an incredible season. Their trajectory is absolutely on the right way. The age profile of the players is just brilliant. So there's no reason why they can't kick on, but it is going to be difficult. Kerry and Dublin are a wee bit ahead of everybody else, and the rest of them. It's just about the momentum Derry carrying on, getting to Croke Park. It, the thing of it is, Croke Park's a very different place to play this you know you can't shut it down in the same way you can shut down clonus or the athletic grounds at Armagh and um, they're just different type pitches crew park just plays bigger regardless of the dimensions and it will be difficult for them but the one thing they have is they have a kicking game you seen yesterday even you couldn't have turned a sweet in your mouth inside the 45 but yet you know Ethan Doherty kicked two or three mm. wee dink balls in and they got points you know Connor Doherty's point came off a wee dink ball in and Derry did try it and again you look at how many times Derry tried the backdoor cut for the goal. You know, Ethan Doherty, who I thought probably didn't get the plaudits of Brenton Rogers and, and Chrissy McKeague yesterday, but I thought he was incredible. Every time Derry needed a line breaker, it was him. And every time he got the ball, he threw a couple of men to him and it always left an overlap. And, and that wee backdoor cut that, that Dublin are so good at, that Kerry are so good at, Derry have a real grow for it now. And the fact of the goal for, uh, for uh, Neil Lachlan, you know, Toner done great work. You see a lot of players coming in there, fisting the point. He'd run out of room, but he had the composure to throw it across and locked into the composure to put it in. And, and it was a big score that, that really gave Derry a platform for staying in the game whenever whenever Donegal had their purple patch. They didn't get too far ahead. Um, if the game would have been a draw, at that point it would have been over. Did you think either of the goals uh, should have been disallowed? I know there was talk last night about the way Stephen McGuigan took Stephen McMenamin out. Now, I'm not sure he intentionally tried to do it, but he did clean him out, and that allowed Nyla Lockton to finish. And then maybe did you think there was a square ball for the Oren McFadden Ferry one? Yeah, initially, for the, I, I didn't actually see the, the first incident at the time. Um, looking back at it, 
I thought it was accidental enough, um, and I, it would have been very, very harsh to disallow that goal. Initially, when I seen the other goal, I thought maybe square ball, but I think the referee got it probably on the balance right, um, and it was a big, it was a big goal. Like Donegal, it was going to take them a long time to get three points and um, to get eight in the dairy score. So the goal there it really set the game up for them, and and they'll be disappointed that they didn't push on, especially when they had a two point lead twice. But I think on the balance of play, the referee. You have the black yard incidents on the balance play. I think he got it just a bit right. One of them might have been, one of them might not have been. But you know, they're they're the things. Refereeing is very very difficult, and in a game like that where free kicks were so hard to come by, you know, every decision had to be absolutely spot on. And you know, and referees have a hard enough job without without me uh, yeah, giving them a hard time. But I thought, you know, on the balance of play, I thought uh, the referee done very well yesterday. Yeah, and I suppose myself and Michael were talking beforehand, where does Brendan Rodgers rank in terms of dual players across the country? Michael, like, obviously Brendan Rodgers, we've seen him do it against Ballyhale Shamrocks when they're at their height in an All-Ireland Club semi-final. There's other players, like, you know, you could talk about Keith Higgins, you could talk about Aidan Walsh over the years, uh, Podge Collins, Colo, Con O'Callaghan. There are a lot of guys out there, but Brendan Rodgers at the moment has to be up near the top of the list. Yeah, well, for sure. You, yeah, and Sorry, go ahead. what's great about Conlon as the dual player is that he can play full forward uh, for one team in the hurlers or wing forward and can play full back at the other. You look at Con full forward probably for both. You look at Podge Collins or anywhere in the forward line, we'll say for both codes as well. But to be able to do it at different ends of the pitch uh, in either code. And if you look at like the Derry hurlers are obviously... Um, you know, well behind the Derry footballers, but you throw Chrissy in there, throw Brendan Rogers in there, and they're going to be, uh, they'd probably be up at Joe McDonough level as well. Um, but he, he's just a phenomenal, he's a phenomenal athlete, a phenomenal player, Connor, to be able to do that, as I say, at, at different ends of the pitch. And we're just saying before you came on, it was probably um, something that Donegal missed to have. Murphy following uh, Rogers in those last 10 or 15 minutes of extra time, making, you know, 100 yard sprints trying to cover this lad who's an absolute gazelle in extra time. Like, it was probably something that Donegal missed as well. It was probably a bit of a mismatch at that stage of the game. Yeah, he's an incredible athlete. He's an incredible footballer. And the problem that Derry would have is that they would, they would need two of them. You know, you could play him in the half back line, the half forward line. And the one thing that he wouldn't be that well known for and Derry would be kicking outrageous points under pressure and he done that yesterday it was just his day and as you say he can play both ends and you add Shane McGuigan into that Derry hurling team and yeah. suddenly yeah. you know you have a team that definitely could uh, could compete at a very very high level um, but in terms of Brenton Rogers' performance it's up there with the great Ulster final performances from you know from Sean Kavanagh from players like that it's up there with it three points Donegal will look at that naively we wondered would Brenton Rogers match up with Murphy go out the field with him. I was surprised whenever Rogers started causing a wee bit of trouble that Donegal didn't put Michael Murphy to full forward just to try and stem that. But look, he wasn't to be denied. And even towards the, the end, Chrissy McKeag ran at the very end, and, and you may be watching TV, you didn't see it. He ran Paddy McBurdy 120 yards right up the field and he had to follow him. And that just kept taking the sting out of the Lex McBurdy, who was just a poacher at that end of the field. So Derry tactically got it spot on. Donegal changed their style to suit Derry and they just weren't as efficient at it. You know, one stage in the first half, Donegal's efficiency was 35% when Derry was 61. So they were the big differences. Donegal had enough chances, but the Achilles heel that kept coming back to haunt them in previous years was not been able to get the scores on the board and, and Derry were a wee bit better at that at, at times when they had the, the ascendancy. Conlon, I know you briefly mentioned it earlier, but can I just ask you about those last 60 seconds where, like, potentially there could, there could have been, a, there was probably a penalty shout. Uh, the free was right on the borderline of a penalty as well. Like, what are you thinking when Murphy is standing over the ball? The way it worked out, I don't think there's a better way to win a game and win an Ulster final with that drama because you literally, it's in your hands one minute, it could be out of your hands the next. But what are you thinking for those last 60 seconds? What are you thinking when Murphy is standing over that free? Yeah, well, the ball goes in, and you've seen penalties given. You know, it was a lot of to and fro, and I think the referee got it right, but you've seen them given. And then when the free was, was given, you're going, right, it's 13 metres out. But the one thing that Murphy, he's as clever as you'll get as a player, you know, a wee bit like the Cork goalies' penalties, where he threw the ball up in the air, then he run. You know, Murphy was maybe six yards out by the time he kicked it, so he used his four steps really strategically. I thought it was a, a really brilliant move for him. But it was going to be eye of the needle stuff. And once it ricocheted out, 
it was hurting the mouse stuff because to lose a game like that, you know, would just have been uh, look, you would never got back and um once it ricocheted out and it was Shane McGuigan who picked it up. And before that, when the high ball went in around the house, it was Shane McGuigan who caught it and came out and then he took cramp after. Shane McGuigan shouldn't have been playing for the last three or four minutes. He was gone, but yet he was still the man. He wasn't to be denied and his performance yesterday, while from play he only kicked one point, but some of his frees were from the top four from his wrong side when they locked him went off as well. Mm. Well, look, Conlon, I know you have to get back, uh, to other work there at the moment, so really appreciate you joining us, and it was uh, Thanks, it really was pretty different. Thank you very much. Enjoy, Conlon. It is. I'd say, I'd say Derry is rocking this morning, and you said, and someone said to me yesterday, uh, you can't be tired if you if you don't go to sleep. For more exclusive content, go to patreon.com forward slash our game.